Welcome to Yeshua House. Welcome to Yeshua House. I'm Pastor Danita Wilkerson, and this is Believer School. We started Believer School to help believers understand their rights and responsibilities in Christ. We are currently in a study on my identity in Christ. This is um, our fourth class, our fourth piece of the study. Um, if you haven't seen it, you haven't heard it, you need to go back and get the other lessons before you start here because you're going to be missing some parts and it just, it won't flow as well. Um, I am going to do a little review for tonight. So go ahead and if you want to listen, you can, but you'll need to go back and get that other information to help you get a full picture of what God has for you and your identity in Christ. Okay, so let me share my screen with you. There we go. Got it. Almost. There we go. Okay, so my identity in Christ part four is where we're at. This is the, I want to go through and review some of the things that we've talked about up to this point. Um, we are using E.W. Kenyon's book, Identification. And he says, this is a romance in redemption, that we're looking at a romance. Jesus is the the groom and the church is the bride. Um, when we talk about the law of identification, I'm teaching about the legal side of our redemption, and it uncovers what Christ did for us, starting at the cross all the way to sitting at the right hand of the Father. It is a vital work to allow the Holy Spirit to work in your life. Um, we were crucified with Christ. That means that when Jesus died, we died. We died there. Uh, with him. He was our substitute, but we died with him there, and um, he died so we could live. He was made sin. While he was hanging on that cross, um, before he had told people that, you know, I lay down my life. You can't take it from me. I lay it down. So when he accepted the sin of mankind on him, he became sin for us. Uh, he became sickness and disease. He took on all of that as well. Um, is it any wonder why he cried, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And then he took our place in judgment. He was sent to hell as our substitute. It, he never sinned. He never did anything wrong, but he took that sin for our account. He became sin so that we could be free. Um, he took all the sickness, all the spiritual side of the sickness and disease. Um, he was our substitutionary work. And a lot of times that becomes more of a doctrine thing than a reality in us for what Jesus did for us. We don't want, we don't want to talk religion here. We want to talk that relationship. Jesus took your sin. Jesus took your disease. Now, some of you go, well, you know, Pastor, I have some sickness on me right now. But you don't have to keep it. Jesus paid for it. And if you learn who you are in Christ and what power and authority you have in his name, then the enemy will have to let you go. Um, we died when he did. He died twice. Jesus died spiritually first. He had a, a body like Adam's that um, it wasn't immortal, but it wasn't mortal. He couldn't die unless sin got on him. And so um, Jesus died spiritually first when he allowed that sin. He took that sin on him and then he died physically. He was our substitute. We were the ones with him on the cross. We were the ones with him in his death. He died under our judgment, in our place. He died because he was made sin. If we accept him, there can be no judgment for us. We were buried with him. For three days and nights, the Lamb of God was our substitute in hell. He was there for us. He had our pains and our diseases, our sin and iniquity. It was there, waiting, 
until the claim of justice was fully met. Such an hour has never been or will ever be again. There had to be an adequate meeting of the penalty of the transgressions of the human race, and he met them. He became one with Satan when he became one with sin. And now he's become, we've become one with him and we are recreated. You see, he has suffered. He endured all that humanity could suffer. He was deity suffering for humanity. He suffered everything that justice demanded. And when he rose from the dead, he pushed back all the powers of darkness. He was righteous once more. He conquered Satan. He conquered death, hell, and the grave. He took back the keys that Satan had stole from Adam. And when, we, when he was raised, we were raised. He is our high priest in heaven. He cleaned everything right to the bottom of the throne of God when he rose from the dead. Christ sits at the right hand of God. There is a human being sitting at the right hand of God, and he is our advocate. It is his blood that paid the cost of our sin. And God wants us to liberate, liberate the power of God in our lives. We need to let God loose in our lives to rule and reign. And we're going to pick up from there and move forward. Okay. Here we go. Satan's persecution of the righteous. Um, Jesus said, blessed are they that have been persecuted for righteousness sake. Later he said, blessed are you when men shall reproach and persecute you. Men don't persecute us for righteousness sake. And this is, it's important. Satan will persecute you for righteousness sake. Like Satan doesn't want you to know Jesus. He doesn't want you to have a relationship with Jesus. He wants to put you down because you're with Jesus. On the ground, on that ground, God did in Christ. He did it in Christ for us. When we were born again, we became the righteousness of God in Christ. You see, I'm made righteous because of what Christ did. I accepted what he did so, so that I can be righteous. That means that we have the ability to cast out demons, just like Jesus did, to break the power of Satan, just like Jesus did, to heal the sick, just like Jesus did, and to raise the dead, just like Jesus did. Righteousness gives us deliverance, and I love this part, from the fear of Satan and his works. Hey guys, that spirit of fear that's been on you and in you and dragging you down, guess what? There's some good news coming to town. Righteousness, I am the righteousness of God in Christ, gives us deliverance from the fear of Satan and his work. All of it. It gives us a new sense of sonship. This son consciousness begets heroic faith. When we get who we are in Jesus, we get heroic faith. It takes away the sense of spiritual inferiority and utterly destroys sin consciousness in us. I, I just love that part because so much of the church has spent all their time looking at sin, paying attention, trying to avoid sin, giving it all sorts of attention. It is such a freeing thing to take sin, consciousness, out of the picture. We can walk before men just as Jesus did because we know that we're new creations. The old life has been utterly destroyed. We know that every sin we've ever committed has been remitted. When you accept Jesus as your Savior and your Lord, every sin you've ever committed your whole life is remitted. It is gone, wiped out, totally erased. We know that sin that we've committed since we've been born again, ignorantly or otherwise, has been forgiven. And we stand in the presence of God just as Jesus did when he walked on the earth. 
You see, when you're born again believer, you have to go to God and repent for your sin. Repenting is not for the unbeliever. It's for us. It's for the church. We have to go to God and say, I'm sorry, I messed up. I, I, I'm asking for forgiveness and God will forgive us. We stand in the presence of God just like Jesus did when he walked on the earth. Dare we not take our stand and make this confession boldly that we get to walk the way Jesus did on this earth. We do not have to walk beat up, busted, and broken. We don't have to walk under the heaviness of sin and demonic oppression. We can walk on this earth just like Jesus did. Satan seeks to keep us sin conscious and rob us of our sun consciousness. As long as he keeps us in sin consciousness, we're whooped. As long as he keeps us in our senses, our eyes, our ears, paying attention to what's going on. When we take that spirit step into the spiritual side of things, into our sonship, he can't beat us. He cannot beat us. Almost all the teaching today tends to keep people under condemnation. The ministry has never realized the work is to free men from sin conscious and make him God conscious, son conscious, victor conscious, faith conscious, and love conscious. When we realize that we've been born of love and that we have the love nature of God in us, we begin to show forth the fragrance of heaven. Romans 8, 37, nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. When we became victory conscious, we will rise as strong men out of a sleep and take our place as victors. The Son has made us free. Let us stand fast in the liberty, in the redemption that has set us free. The knowledge of his will. This is a problem that bothers most of God's people. How to know the will of the Father? The will of the Father is wrapped up in his word. Jesus said, I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but to do the will of the one who sent me. Jesus knew what the Father's will was. He said, I always do the things that are pleasing in his sight. 2 Corinthians 5. That he made it his business to be well-pleasing to the Father. You see, Jesus wanted to please the Father. I want to please the Father. I think that's that's, that's the whole goal is to please Father. If Jesus could please the Father and do his will, if Father, I mean, I'm sorry, if Paul could please the Father and do his will, know it and do it, it's possible for all, us also to know it and do it. So what are the grounds for that assurance? In the first place, we have his mind and his will in the word. If we search the word diligently, allowing the spirit to guide us in it, we will arrive in spiritual growth and development through constant meditation in the word so that his will will be an unconscious consciousness to us. It will be an automatically part of our being because we're choosing God's way. He said, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly admonishing you and building you up. Paul said to the Ephesian church when he bade them goodbye, I commend you to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you the inheritance among them that are sanctified. You see?
Colossians 1.19. Oh, sorry, 1.9. For this cause, also since the day we heard, we do not cease to pray and to make requests for you that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding to walk worthily of the Lord unto all pleasing, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. You see, the word knowledge comes from the Greek word epignosis, which means correct knowledge, full, complete knowledge. We are being filled with correct knowledge. Then he gives us wisdom to use perfect knowledge. Someone says, that doesn't seem credible that we could have perfect knowledge. Well, why shouldn't we? We will have a perfect revelation of his will. The Bible is a perfect book. The Holy Spirit is a perfect teacher. And we're perfect new creatures created in Christ Jesus. And we have perfect righteousness. We have perfect relationship. And he says we've become partakers of the very fullness of Christ. Of his fullness, we all received. And grace upon grace, our redemption is complete redemption. That means that every need of a human and answers every challenge of divine fullness. If this is true, I don't know why we can't have complete knowledge. I want you to notice in John 3, 3 through 36, that we're born from above. And it's in there several times. If this is true, I don't know why we can't have complete knowledge. I want you to notice that complete knowledge means we're born from above. That new birth is not a work of psychology or human philosophy or a human ability. We're born not of corruptible things, but of incorruptible word of God, which lives and abides in us. James tells us of his own will he begat us. John 1, 13. We are born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. The creation the new creation is the work of the Holy Spirit through the word. It is a perfect work. It makes us complete in him. You are complete in Christ. There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. That's Romans 8, 1. If you who read this can accept the word, you will begin to blossom and bear fruit of joy and peace that you have never known before. When you preached at it so many years that we are poor and miserable creatures and unworthy and unfit and the scriptures were written to the Jews and they were in apostasy. That means falling away from God's rules and doing what was right in their own eyes. And they applied that to the church. Also the scriptures to the ungenerated applied to the church till the church has, be, has an inferiority complex in regard to sin. We're afraid of it. It has lived, and we just lived in that realm. We've lived in that sin consciousness, in the sense of unworthiness so long that the word has little effect on us. We want to bring this to you today. The word is a perfect message. You may have perfect knowledge of your father's will, and it would be interesting to look up the scriptures we're getting ready to go through, just to have them and write them down and learn them. Ephesians 1.17 That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. It's the knowledge, it's not the knowledge of sense what I can see, what I can hear, what I can feel, uh, what I can taste. It's not that. But the knowledge of him, or it could be said, the knowledge of who you are in him. 
and the Spirit is going to guide your heart into this. That's a pretty good promise, huh? Ephesians 4.13, till we attain unto the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God until a full-grown man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. This is a complete and full knowledge to which we are going to grow. And this expression occurs 12 to 14 times in the New Testament, especially in the epistles. It has driven me to believe that the Father expects us to know his will. Colossians 1, 12 through 13, giving thanks unto the Father who has given us the ability to enjoy our share of inheritance of the saints in light, who did rescue us out of the power of darkness and did translate us into the region of his Son, region of the Son of his love. You see, the Greek word dunamis was translated of power but it would be better to translate it in this case as ability who did rescue us out of the ability of darkness and did translate us into the region of his son of his love god has given us his ability to know his will and to know what our share is in the inheritance in the saints in life we have the ability. It's a God-given ability. We have the Holy Spirit. And Jesus said that he would guide us into all truth. He is our teacher, our guide, our indwelling instructor. I cannot see where there's any ground for us to live in weakness and failure and ignorance of the Father's will and of our place in standing in Christ and of our rights and privileges. We have no more right to dishonor the Father and dishonor Jesus than Jesus when he walked on the earth. We are sons and daughters of God. We are heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. We have privilege and rights in the family. The first privilege is to make the heart of Father glad. Having your own faith. Think of having your own faith. Think of the thrill of having your own prayers answered. This is a real stick in point. A lot of people have trouble with their own faith. Um, Mr. Kenyon shared a couple of stories. I'm going to go ahead and share them with you. A mother rushed up to Mr. Kenyon and said, uh, Mr. Kenyon, God heard my prayers last night and healed my baby. She had been a Christian for years and had never had her prayers answered. A grandmother, um, you'll never believe the joy I've experienced. My little grandchild was very sick and in a dangerous condition. Then I remembered the name of Jesus and my rights in Christ. I went to the back sick room and knelt down by my baby and I put my arms around it and I commanded in the name of Jesus that the disease leave the baby and the baby be healed. The mother stood by the bed, tears streaming down her face. The baby opened his eyes and looked at his mother and smiled. God heard my prayer. I turned and laid my hands on my daughter who had been very sick since the child was born. She was here. Can you imagine what it means to me? It's the first time in my life I've ever saw my prayers answered like that. This should be a normal experience for everyone. When you realize the great majority of Christians have never had a prayer answered, can you understand what I meant by having my own faith? Most Christians are depending upon other people's faith. They can do the praying, but they want somebody else to do the believing. In reality, they're not praying. They're just repeating words or a prayer in the New Testament, like a sense is born of faith and is always answered. You see, the Father planned that all should have faith. 
Mark 16, 17 and 18. And these signs will accompany them that believe. Now accompany, like if you were going to a movie and you were taking your sister along, then if she was accompanying you to the movie, she'd be right there with you. These signs are supposed to be with believers. In my name, they shall cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. If they drink any deadly thing, it will not hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. In whom is he speaking? Of a woman or a man who has just accepted Christ as their savior and confessed him as Lord. He has just received eternal life. At once, he begins his combat with the unseen forces of darkness. Someone is sick or in bondage, he exercises his rights. In the name of Jesus, he commands the power of Satan broken. Acts 20, 32 shows the place of the word in the life of believers. Now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance of among all them that are sanctified. To build you up means to build up your faith in love and your ability to help humanity. Your faith may be developed until it becomes a mighty force. That was the dream of your father. The word will build up your sense of righteousness. I know of nothing that's needed more than this. When we become conscious that we are righteous, we will not think of ourselves as weak and failing anymore. Isaiah 32, 17. The work of righteousness shall be peace, and the effect of righteousness, quietness, and confidence forever. This verse does not belong to Israel. It belongs to the church. We have the work of righteousness that God brought to me, and he brings peace in your heart. Romans 8, 1 and 2. There is therefore now no condemnation for them that are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. You live in perfect quietness and rest. The effect of righteousness on your heart is a new quietness, a new type of faith. You enjoy the effect of your confidence in the finished work of Christ. You know that you are the master of circumstances. You know that you're the master of demons. You know that if you lay hands on a sick person, he will be healed. The realization of this truth gives you a sense of quietness, a fullness of joy that you have never enjoyed before. The phrase confidence forever is striking. You have moved out of the restless atmosphere of fear and doubt and into quiet waters of victory. You have become the master where you served as a slave. You're a conqueror where you were defeated. You walk in light where you had to walk in darkness. You enjoy the privileges in Christ. At last, you have your own faith. At last, you've arrived. John 15, 5. And you know, do you know? You know what this means. I am the vine and you are the branches. He that abideth in me and I abide in him, the same bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. You enjoy the consciousness of the life of the vine, you abiding in you. You are fruit bearing part of Christ. You have been grafted into him by the new birth, made a new creature. That graft has given you a new nature. You bear the Jesus kind of fruit, which is love fruit and faith fruit. The word is benefited by it. The world is benefited by it. Christians are lifted everywhere you go to new consciousness of their rights and privileges in Christ. There's that John 15, 7. 
if you abide in me and ask whatever you will and it shall be done for you. You know you do abide in him. You bear the fruitage of his indwelling word. His word in your lips produces real results. The Father's word in Jesus' lips heals the sick. His word in your lips does the same. You know what it means to have a legal right and whatever you demand, he gives you. The word demand is used in its truest sense. John 16, 23 through 24. And Jesus said, And that day you will ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, if you ask anything of the Father, he will give it to you in my name. The word ask means demand, and it's not being used in the sense like command him to give it to you, but in the sense like you're going to the bank and you demand payment on a check. In the same sense of your faith takes its rights and its portions. At last, you know, James 1, 22 through 24 means, but if you're a doer of the word and not a hearer only, deluding your own selves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man looking at his face in a mirror. For he sees himself and goes away and forgets what he looks like. You have become a doer of the word. You are not just a hearer. You do not delude yourself with false hopes. You are in Christ. You are heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ Jesus. You know that his word abides in you and produces results. You are a producer. You are not marking time any longer. You know what manner of man you are. You know that you're a new creation empowered by God. The other day, I looked at one of the new cars. Um, this is um, Pastor Kenyon's story. And the salesman said there's a 160 horsepower motor under that hood. I said, wow, that could climb a mountain. The man said, it laughs at mountains. I stood beside a believer and I said, that man is empowered with God's ability. He laughs at all grades. He sings songs of triumph as he goes over in high. He's not a subject, a slave. He passes out, he passes out of the class into the class of a master. He remembers in the morning of what manner of man he is. He faces life with the song of victory. The word of Christ dwells in him richly and produces wisdom and prudence. The word has come, become part of God to him, a part of a living Christ to him. Day by day, the great, mighty spirit who raised Jesus from the dead builds that word into his spirit consciousness. Christ is being formed in him. Galatians, it is no longer I that live, but Christ lives in me. One of these days, Christ in all his fullness will dominate. Will dominate each one of us until we can softly whisper, it is no longer I that live, but Christ who lives in me. Colossians 2, 6 and 7. As there for you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built it up in him, established in your faith, even as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. The scripture is real to Paul. Did you ever notice Ephesians 4, 7? But unto each one of us was given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Now we are moving into the big things. The guide said, and this is another one of um, Pastor Kenyon's stories, in a few minutes we'll begin to see the redwood section and you'll see the giants of the vegetable world. I said softly as I walked into the prayer meeting, we're coming into the spiritual redwoods. 
we're going to see the spiritual giants, the supermen and women of the faith. They have God's will in them. The word of Christ is rich on their lips. They love that relentless drove Jesus that relentless love that drove Jesus to the cross to gain the possession of us. They no longer walk as natural men. They belong to the love class, the miracle class. They are in the Jesus class. They have graduated from the lower class. They are the men and the women who attained to the unity of faith and knowledge in the Son of God and have become full grown men and women unto the measure and the stature of the fullness of Christ. They have their own faith. They are established in the truth. The word is real to them. Love's identification. We have seen the new creation is utterly one with Christ. Absolutely one with Christ. We have seen the new creation is one in love one in him, and love is one with the new creation. The new creation is the body of Christ, the living organism, God-dominated, God-filled, is here among men acting in love, acting in Jesus's place, taking over Jesus's work. In the first chapter of Acts, Luke says, by the Spirit, the things of Jesus began to do and teach. We began where he left off. We take up that work that he laid down. He was the burden bearer, the lover. He is acting in us, through us, and with us. Burden bearers. We are now burden bearers. We carry his load with his strength. We do his will with his ability. He is living his life in us. We know, though perhaps we do not realize it, it is no longer I that live, but Christ that lives in me. We have lost the landmarks of sense knowledge since we've learned to walk in a new way. He said, I am the way. It's not a road, it's not a person, it's not a theory, it's a reality, it's not a doctrine, it's a life. It's not a dogma or a doctrine. They've lost their significance. They are worn out shells of yesterday. They have held us in bondage for years and now we are swallowed up in Jesus. Romans 15, 1 and 2. We that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. This is Jesus' method. He was strong. He took our infirmities. We take over the weaknesses of others. We're not their critics. and We do not condemn them because they fail. We go down and take their burdens and let them walk at our side as free men. We do not condemn one who is held in prison by Satan, for we remember that we were once slaves. We are the strength givers, the burden bearers, the light leaders in a world of darkness. What a ministry it is to take Jesus' place. What a life it is to bear the burdens of the weak, carry the load that others should have strength to carry. What have faith for those who are faithless, courage for those who are whipped, wisdom for those who have long walked in darkness. We are the Jesus men and women of the new age. John 15, 9 and 10. Even as the Father has loved me, I also love you. Abide you in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. We are to love as he loved, pour out our lives as he poured out his. 2 Corinthians 5, 13 and 14. But whether we are beside ourselves, it is unto God. 
or whether we are of sober mind, it is up to you. For the love of Christ constrains us, for we must judge that one died for all, therefore all died. Paul saw a real issue and gave it to us in. Paul believed in love to the extent that he believed he was beside himself. Paul's answer was, the love of Christ has taken hold of my heart, and I realized that Christ's death was every man's death. The same love that caused Christ to die for man constrained Paul's heart and was causing him to live for them. The attitude of love is this. I love them as though I died for them. Paul's even stronger in his description of love, love's identification in Romans 9, 3. This is Moffat's translation. I suffer endless anguish of heart. I could have wished myself accused, banished from Christ for the sake of my brothers. In reading this, to feel we can hardly come up to, but it is not hard because he has made us love. He has made us like himself. What he was in his earth walk, we are now in our earth walk. He has taken us over in order that we might take over his dream for me. It sounds strange, but it's beautifully true that we love as he loved. We love with his love. We look upon people through eyes of love. We used to say, well, they're just reaping what they've sown. We used to see them through sense knowledge eyes. Now we say, Father, help me help them. I'm taking your wisdom and your strength and carrying the load that they have failed to take strength to carry. I have been deceived by sense knowledge. They have been deceived by sense knowledge and I take their place and carry their burden as you have taken my place and borne my burden. We speak of them with love's voice and with love's message. Now, I'm gonna stop just for a half second because for my codependent friends that wanna carry everybody else's burden, that is not what this is talking about. This is in the sense of faith, this is in a sense of love. Um, this is not your carrying false burden bearing for someone else. It's not your job here. You just had to get that piece in there. We are love transmitters. Our identification with him puts us on the throne. He, his identification with us puts us in the place of leaders, teachers, comforters, helpers, and burden bearers. We bring God to man just as he came to us. We are love as he is love. We are love's lips, love's hands, and feet. Cool the dam. Uh, E.W. Kenyon was talking about the dam. I didn't know about it, so I had to go look it up. Um, the Columbia River um, west of Spokane, Washington, it's one of the largest structures ever built by mankind. It um, is 550 feet high and 5,223 feet long, um, just shy of a mile. Um, and it contains 12 million cubic yards of concrete. That, that's a lot. But Kenyon said, without wires, the mighty generators of the Cooley Dam would be helpless. Just love can find no expression except through the new creation. The great generators are dependent on the wires. They and they alone can bear the current that stirs those motors and lights the homes of the Northwest. Can't you see if you fail him, he is helpless. We limit him or we allow him to be limitless. For many ages, the power and the ability of the mighty Columbia River was never utilized. For nearly 2,000 years, the limitless ability of God has been unused. The church has been weak and powerless, 
Sin has reigned as a master and the church has served as a slave. Yet the church represents the new creation, which is a Satan conqueror. Shall we allow it to go on? You have seen the truth in this mighty message of identification. And what are you going to do with it? We hold the key. Will God be great amongst men once more? Will he heal and save the multitudes? Will the vast hordes of men once again hear the message of grace from the lips set on fire with love? Will the Peters once more walk on the waves? Shall we hear them saying to the cripple, arise, walk? Shall we see men set free from Satan's dominion? Yes. I believe we will. We are the masters. We have arrived. We have the thing the human spirit craves. We are whispering now, greater is he who is in us than any opposition, than any lack that confronts us. Can't you hear the voice saying, this is God speaking? We remember what manner of men and women he has made us. We fear not. At last, we are masters. We are God created. We are God indwelt. We are God empowered and we are God guided. We are the ones in whom love never fails. Come, let us go up and take the land. We are well able. When these truths really gain reality in us. They will make us spiritual supermen, masters of demons and diseases. This is the unveiling of what we are in Christ, how the Father sees us in the Son. It will be an end of the weakness and failure. We will be no more struggling for faith, for all things are ours. There will be no more praying for power, for he is in us. There will be no, no longer the awful bondage of sin consciousness, for we are the righteousness of God in Christ. We know what we are in Christ. We know that he dwells in us. We know the authority of his name. We are God inside minded. We have his ability. We have his wisdom. We have his love. We are his righteousness. He lives in us. His lordship is reality. His word is present tense in our heart. We have a standing invitation to his throne room. We're invited to come boldly into his presence. And we are seated with him in heaven. He is with us on earth. In the presence of these tremendous realities, we arise and take our place. We go out and live as supermen and superwomen indwelt of God. Ada Buchanan wrote a song, and these are the lyrics. We're gonna go through and read them. I'm gonna go through and read them for you real quick to the song, but the, it was called Identified. And in the crucifixion on the cross with Jesus Christ identified. In the death for man's eternal loss with Jesus Christ identified. Identified, identified with Jesus Christ identified. In all he was or is or shall be eternally identified. In burial beneath the cursed ground with Jesus Christ identified. In hell's deep dungeon where he's found with Jesus Christ identified. In victory over hell's dark host with Jesus Christ identified. Yes, while he paid sin's awful cost with Jesus Christ identified. In resurrection, mighty power with Jesus Christ identified. At God's right hand this very hour with Jesus Christ identified. In accordance in coordination, glorious day, with Jesus Christ identified. When he by right shall kingdom sway with Jesus Christ identified. That's pretty neat. I like it. 
Well, the Lord has asked me every time I have a class to make sure that I give everybody an opportunity who doesn't know Jesus as Lord and Savior to accept him. Sorry, I was really dry. <coughs> and so if you would like to make Jesus the Lord of your life and start this new creation, this new life, then you're just going to repeat this prayer after me with faith and believing what you say. You say, I come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I know that you will not cast me out. I come to you in the name of Jesus. And I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I believe that Jesus died for me according to the scriptures. And I believe that he was raised from the dead for my justification according to the scriptures. So that I might be set right with God. I believe that because of his death, burial, and resurrection, that I am set right with God. So I receive Jesus as my Savior and accept Jesus as my Lord. Your word says in Romans 10, verses 9 and 10, that anyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And I'm calling on the name of the Lord so I know that I am saved. You say. If I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead, that I would be saved. And with my heart, I believe I am made righteous with God. And with my mouth, I confess I am saved. God bless you. See you next week. Bye.